belief. That's not the title. I'll tell you what the title is in a minute, but we're not there yet. Okay. So, <laughs> belief. If, if we don't believe, why are we here? What, what, what makes it different is that we believe. And do we know what it is that we believe? If God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that means that he's the same God that we read about in the Old and New Testaments. He's the same miracle-working God that works outside of any box we could possibly think about, anything that we could possibly consider. And he has done more, infinitely more, than we can even begin to fathom with the, the finite wisdom and knowledge that we have in this earthly vessel. There is so much more to everything that's around us than what we see. If, if only we would actually have the eyes to see into the spirit, to see things in the unseen realm. Absolutely, truly amazing. And I've heard it, I've probably heard it four or five times in the last week alone, that anything that you can see, right, has an expiry date. It doesn't matter whether it's a chair, the carpet, the lights, the body, everything has an expiry date. Sooner or later, everything that we can see now is going to turn back to the dust which it came from. Sometimes it happens faster than we expect. There's all kinds of things along the way. But the, 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 the message that the Lord has impressed upon me tonight, for, for whatever reason with this group of people, I can't say other than I'm just delivering what I was given. And that is, the gift was given. All right. Is it received? We'll get into this in a minute, but if you're out in the freezing cold and somebody gives you a coat and you choose not to wear it, it never comes out of the closet if you have one, but you never put it on. The coat is there to give you warmth, to keep you dry, to keep you insulated, to keep you somewhat comfortable in the elements that you may be exposed to. It's right there. And yet, you choose not to put it on. There could be a million dollars in a box given to you with all wrapped up and say, this is for whatever you need. And it's wrapped up. And let's just say for a minute that you don't particularly care for the individual that gave it to you, for whatever reason. Personalities rub or chafe. Perhaps you've had, you know, one of those things that's been going on since childhood. You tolerate one another, but you really don't have a whole lot to do with one another. And we probably all got someone like that. Maybe it's someone you work with. Maybe it's somebody you haven't known that long. And just something happens that just grinds your gears. And because it came from them, you won't receive it. You don't even open it. You have no idea what's inside that box. Somebody gives you something, let's say it's, it's you know, a box of donuts, and you open it up, and you go, oh, there's no Boston cream. Right? <laughs> it, it, we're, we live in a society that is so spoiled and has a sense of such entitlement that, that we think we can dictate the gifts that we get. Now, I know, you know, there's, there's all kinds of stuff that, that happens. And I know that, you know, as parents with our children, the children will say something that we want and, and we'd like to you know, move heaven and earth to give them what they want as long as we know it won't harm them. But the greatest gift of all, as probably any woman in this room will tell you, men, sometimes, I'll speak for myself, I won't cast a broad net, but I don't think I'm alone. Sometimes we don't do hints real well. 
Sometimes, sometimes it needs to be plainly spoken. And so the greatest gift we can give is one that, that they didn't have to tell you they wanted. It's one that because you know what they like, you know their style, you know that when you see that thing, it's exactly what they would like. And when you give that gift, it is greatly and cheerfully and wonderfully received. Sometimes the gifts that we give, right, are, are a gesture, but it's almost like a throwaway gesture because we do it because we felt like we needed to give something, but it has no meaning. And because of the day and age that we live in, we are subconsciously programmed the same way. Now I know we are all new creations. I know that we all have the mind of Christ. I know that we appear transformed by the renewing of our mind and the washing of the word. But we rub shoulders with the world almost every minute of every day. And there's exposure, even if it's subconscious. It doesn't matter if it's literature you're reading, if it's music you're listening to, if it's the radio, heaven forbid, the news, the TV, the programs, the movies, whatever. We are bombarded with all kinds of wonderful things and all kinds of wonderful technology. But it's all programming us to think contrary to how we were built and designed. So I want to talk about the gift because there is absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing, and hear me when I say, absolutely nothing that we need that God has not provided for us. The question is, have we received the gift? If we've received the gift, have we done so cheerfully, gratefully, with an attitude of thanksgiving? He gave his only beloved son for us that we may have eternal life and that we may deli be delivered from the bondages of this world. Delivered from the bondages of this world. That means we ought not to be shackled with what is considered normal. Pastor Gary just finished talking about, about the, 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 the revival. It's going to be the unraveling of normal. There is not going to be anything normal about it because it's going to be so counterculture to what we're used to and what we're exposed to. Why? Because when we start to walk in the gifts that he has given us and begin to understand the gift and the power that he has given us, it is going to be absolutely and truly mind-expandingly incomprehensible. Every day is going to be something and it's like, whoa! You know, the angels go around the throne room of God every day saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. I better get into some word. Hallelujah. Let, let's turn to Romans 5.13. Of course, as per my norm, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. We all have our favorites. So, Romans 5.13. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Still, everyone died. From the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now Adam, a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the son of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. 
For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. Woohoo! How many times did we read the word gift in that passage? Eh? And that's what really, really hit me. And you've heard me say this before, so this, this one's not new. You're looking at somebody that has been performance-driven pretty much my entire life. You know, a true gift is given without, without merit, without cost, without being earned. So there is nothing we can do to make ourselves more holy or more righteous. It is a finished work. All we need to do is believe and walk and talk as if it was true. So do we believe the word? Do we believe God? Well, he's not a liar. His word tells us that. He's not a liar. He's not the son of man that he should lie. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Please. Chapter 5 and verse 16. So we, are we there? We're still here pages. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. Some of us still evaluate others from a human point of view. So, so we need to watch that, right? So we have stopped. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world, world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And, we give us this, he, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, Come back to God, for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So it doesn't matter how guilty we may feel or perceive ourselves to be. What does that word just tell us? That we are righteous and he has forgiven us. Now, it's interesting, today I had a chance to actually sit down with my sister for a minute, and, and we noticed one common trait between us as we were exchanging, exchanging stories. And one of them is that we're quick to accept responsibility, but we're also quick to accept responsibility for things that aren't our problem or aren't our fault. So there is an automatic sense of guilt the moment that you're confront, confronted or challenged. It's like, I, I, rem, I remember so well as a child in school, all the teacher had to do is say my name, and I, I could feel the blood rushing into my face. My complexion would change from this pale white skin, which I'm pretty much still the same, but, but I just had this, this, this rosy red fiery glow that I could feel from the inside out. It was, I didn't do anything wrong. 
but there's automatic sense of, it's like I can be driving down the road, right? And a police car can be behind me and automatically I'm thinking, am I speeding? Am I doing something wrong? Did I go through a red light? Why? Because the enemy is a real dirty scumbag and he's full of lies and he's trying to wear us down, whittle us down bit by bit, piece by piece. And he's trying to expose us to the point that we forget that it is a finished work and we don't have to do it. We can't do it, even if we want to. And let me share that with you too. I have tried because I wanted to and I can't do it. Nothing can be more frustrating than wanting to do something and being unable to do it. Can't understand why it won't work. Well, it's not yours to do. We're not built or equipped to do something that's already been finished by the master of creation who knows everything, the end from the beginning and everything in between, and he's predestined us. He knows what we're able to do. That's why he sent Jesus Christ on the cross for us because he knew we couldn't do it. <laughs> so, wow. What is the gift? So just let's humor me for a second because I'm the one with the microphone. <laughs> but if we go to dictionary.com, it says, a gift is something given voluntarily without payment in return as to show favor towards someone honor an occasion, or make a gesture of assistance or a present. Doesn't that sound wonderful? A voluntary gift, not an obligatory gift. Ever, ever, ever go into a place where, where they automatically put a tip or a gratuity on a bill, whether you want to give one or not? You know, I always looked at it as being a, a, a tip or a gratuity as something that was earned for exceptional service. The better the service, the better the tip. The poorer the service, the more they got wrong, the more they forgot about us, the longer they kept us waiting, the lower the number got. That's not the way God works. See, it's also something that's bestowed or acquired without any particular effort by the recipient or without its being earned. Ouch. It's not earned because if it was earned, it's like wages. So when you work for somebody, when you work for an employer, at the end of the day, the pay or the end of the week or the month or however it works, at the end of that pay cycle, you get what you earned. It's not a gift. Contrary to what some employers might seem to think. <laughs> yes, we are privileged to have a job. Yes, they are privileged to have us working there. But us working there is not part of the gift that they're giving us with a paycheck. That's not what it is, because it's earned. See, a gift is not deserved, because if it was deserved, it would imply an earned or merit or performance-based return. So, you know, you've heard me say before, too, you know, as a, as a kid, everything, everything we ever got was always contingent on whether I was a good boy, you know? Did I behave? Did I talk back? Did I get good grades? Whatever, whatever the case may be, everything had a string attached. And I'm sure my parents had good intent for doing that. They were probably trying to teach me balance and you know respect, and I responded to rewards. So they knew that that was a way to engage me. But it also built a false precedence in me that made me think that everything I ever get has to be earned. Whether it's respect, whether it's trust, whether it's a gift. You know, at Christmas time, you used to get gifts. And, and instead of saying from mom and dad or from Santa Claus or whatever, it would say from C or from H or from R. Are from 
I or from S or from T, as in Christ, as in Christmas, or M or E, as in Mary. And all in the time leading up to Christmas, I all I'd have to do is, you know, talk back or, you know, slam the door when I wasn't supposed to or, or do something. And I say, well, there's the sea gone. After the first year of knowing what that meant, <laughs> I learned really quick. But what did that do? That created that sense of, of performance, right? Always needing to attain, always needing to achieve. And I know I'm not the only one, it may be a radical example, but I'm not the only one that sees the things of God that way. Well, I'm here to tell you, that is not the way God is. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. And it doesn't matter what we do. It may make him happy, but it doesn't make us get the gift or we don't get salvation because we were good. We don't get blessed because we did a good thing. We don't get blessed because we... We get blessed because we're a good God. We serve and worship a good God who wants to give us and bestow to us good gifts. And there, I know there are times when he wants to get stuff to us but we are the obstacle. We are the obstruction. Because, well, have you ever had somebody give you money and say, oh, no, thanks, I I can't. (laughs) Okay, maybe I'm the only one. (laughs) You know, or or somebody wants to help you and say, no, no, that's thanks, I'm good. Meanwhile, I'm sitting there. (laughs) Right? Like, You know, people want to bestow good and we want to do good for others. God wants to do good for us. He wants to bless us. We just need to get ourselves into that position where we can believe the word that he says as being absolutely true. Without question, without doubt. Now we can talk about faith all we want, but if we don't don't know or don't trust the character of God, we're not going to receive it. You know, it's like when something bad happens, it's like, you know, oh, there goes the sea. <laughs> right? You say, well, I guess I deserve that. No. The devil is cruel. He's a liar and the father of them, and he is full of deceit. Why did Jesus come? He came to destroy the works of the enemy. So, did he? Yes. <laughs> right on, he did. Do we accept that? Some of us do, for sure. Some of us have been a long time getting there. Because, well, you know, I know I'm a, I'm a special case, you know. <laughs> I'm just that kind of, I'm just that kind of, twisted individual that I just, you know, he'd have to be lashed an extra 20 times because of what I did. You know, he'd have to have four spikes instead of three because three is just not enough for me. You know, believe it or not, that is pride. There is nobody so bad what is it, the, the old hymn, it says, the, the vilest offender who truly believes? Right. Ephesians 3.14. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and earth. I pray that his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts. As you trust in him, your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, 
though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all the glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we ask or think. Mm, Doesn't that float your boat? Mm. And yet, there are so many people in the span of our sphere of influence that don't believe there's a God, that don't believe in the goodness of God. How many times have you ever had a friend say, well, I dare not set foot in your church. The Lord will probably strike me with lightning as I get to the foot of the door. I've had friends that have said that. I said, no, no, he loves you too much to strike you with lightning. And they look at you like you got three heads and you just let, let, let the seed grow. Water it with love and encouragement. See, our job, our part of our job is to do that reconciliation, right? It's to show people that it is a finished work. I remember, I remember one day, and I, I, I guess I can share this because there's no names involved, but, but many years ago, I was, I was at the, one of the Billy Graham crusades and, and was, you know, one of the people that went down with people when they came forward. And, and the man looked at me and said, well, God, God can never have anything to do with me. I said, oh, he absolutely could. He goes, no, man. He said, you don't understand. He said, you know, I've, I've killed people. I've done time in prison. I'm a, I'm a bad cat. I'm a bad, bad man. And I said, well, God loves you. I said, the things you've done may have not been according to the best plan, but that doesn't change his love for you. It doesn't matter how bad we are. It does not affect his love for us. And being the greatest person, that most saintly individual, right, who does, you know, the sun shines when they smile. The room changes temperature when they walk in. There's just a sense of, oh, when they walk in, right? It doesn't change anything. See, a lot of times it's not what we expect. And, and a lot of times, things don't come the way we expect, or in the manner, or through whom we expect. I think, Pastor Gary, I think it was on Sunday where, where you talked about the, the, the phone call, where the, the minister got a phone call saying, you know, how much is your, your mortgage? And, and pay it off. That is not a normal thing. But I know of people that have received cars that way. Hey, you know, there's a car. Yeah, right on. The Tribe of Judah drag racer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The pilot for uh, Keith Moore. Amen. Hallelujah. See, we, see we, we serve an awesome God, and, and yet we try to, can I use the term pigeonhole him, you know, into our, you know, sphere of understanding. Our box is like little weenie compared to what his, you know, I think of that infinite cosmic power. Little bitty living space. (laughs) Robin Williams thing from Aladdin, I think is what, you know, and, and it makes me laugh because sometimes, you know, we are literally trying to put God in a box. Even when, even when, when David wanted to build the temple, Right. You you can't build a habitation for me. I will dwell there, but I'm way beyond that. The Ephesians, holy mackerel. Ephesians chapter two. I thought I was doing good this time with my notes. I haven't even got anywhere. Ephesians two chapter, or Ephesians chapter two, verse eight. Thank you. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. 
It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he has planned for us long ago. Yeah, see, with us, we cannot take credit. Nor, nor can we take the blame when things don't work out the way we expect. But I can tell you this. All things, all things can work together for good for those who... See? You guys got it. There's someone out there that needs it. I know I've gone on and preached myself happy now anyway. <laughs> if nobody else needed it, I guess I did. Yeah. Hmm. Where do I go now, Lord? There's no way I can finish this. I know you never finish. You just stop, right? Well, two, 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 uh, two more passages. Can we do that? <laughs> so Romans chapter 4, and verse 1. Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that is not God's way. For the scriptures tell us, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. When people work, their wages are not a gift. Right? Didn't we? we just spoke about that, right? But something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. David also spoke of this when we described the happiness of those who are declared righteousness without working for it. Now, let me just be clear. Just because this is all done for us does not give us license to go and do anything that we want. Because that will have an impact on relationship. Whether it changes the truth of what he has done, it will it'll change our standing in the way that we understand and receive. Because with every one of those things, if it's contrary to God's word, the Spirit will convict. And there will be challenges. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those who record the Lord, whose record, sorry, the Lord has cleared of sin. See, again, there's so much more. I got one more, one more passage, but just before I get there, you know, we, we, can, we can think of three particular men in the Bible who, who knew something was coming long before it ever did. We, first of all, look at Joseph, the man who had the dream, who saw everybody bowing to him, made the mistake of telling his brothers about it, <laughs> but he had a dream. He was sold as a slave, ended up in prison. He was, you know, doing well in prison, but was in prison right, before he became the prince of Egypt. We can look at David, anointed as the outcast of the family, anointed to be the next king. How many years did he spend? running from the spear of the current king. How many times was he almost pinned up against the wall, running from cave to cave, but he's the next king. But he's running from cave to cave and then dodging a spear. Okay, but he's the next king. Paul. He's, the man's responsible for like two-thirds of the New Testament. You think, surely, you know, 
he was a man called of God, and he surely was. But have you read his bio? Have you read his resume? <laughs> the man was stoned, beaten, had rods, whips, scourge, shipwreck, snake bit. Like, man, Brother Paul, are you sure you're serving God? Are you sure you're in the will of God? You must be doing something wrong, brother. I went to those churches. <laughs> you end up with a cough or a sniffle, or heaven forbid you end up in hospital, say, Brother Don, are you sure you're following the will of God? <laughs> that does a number on you when you're a new believer, I want to tell you. Again, especially when you think of my history and context of the performance, both good and bad. <laughs> Rattle you to the core, it does. But praise God, praise he saw me through. Yes. I'm standing here. Yes. I'm preaching the word of God. He changed me. He's continuing to change me. Yes. The closer I get to him, the more he changes me and the more my fire gets lit. All right. Hallelujah. All right, I better wrap this up. It's a warm, it's a warm sunny night, but I, I, I don't want to overstay my welcome. <laughs> Romans 8. And again, familiar passages of Scripture, right? But again, think of it in context of the gift, right, that he has given us. And, and our belief in him and his word and the finished work. Romans 8, 26. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. So anybody ever have a moment of weakness? or two? <laughs> Today? <laughs> Since supper? <laughs> Just thinking, you know, out loud. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes for them. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers, which means you're one of the many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. Nothing, let me say that again for emphasis, nothing, no thing can separate us from God's love. It doesn't matter how bad your day is, was, or may be, nothing can separate us from his love. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since, we, since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Okay, the fact that this is in here, means there are things that are going to try and separate you, right? We know that for every force, there is an equal and opposite force. So if God's word is telling us that nothing can separate us from Christ, that's equivalent to that, you know, the fear not. Why is that there? Because there's fear. You have the choice to fear, right? We can be separated. We can be divided. We can be offended, but we shouldn't be. 
Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? (laughs) As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced, as Paul was when he wrote this, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Woohoo! <laughs> hey! hey. <laughs> God is good. He loves you. His amazing love, He wants to pour out upon each and every one of us. And it is a finished work. If we believe, we just need to tap into it. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Gary. <laughs> Thank you, Ashton, for that. <laughs> Nobody in all my life before Ashton ever got away with calling me Johnny. <laughs> it, you know, it sure is. Like, you know, I'm not the uptight, <laughs> wound tight individual. He's given me liberty and freedom, and I thank you. And it's growing. Thank you. Thank you. We hope this message has encouraged you in your relationship with the Lord. For more information and ministry resources, we invite you to visit our website at www.newcovenantchurch.ca. We look forward to you joining us next time as we continue to live victoriously.